thank you very much, and uh, and he hello everybody. And uh, yeah, don't don't please steal Doug from me at the end of this talk. Um, uh, so so Open is about uh, really taking uh, images of uh, cultural heritage objects seriously as images. Um, and uh, so here I give you the world of the medieval book and 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 how do I no. try to pay you have to click yeah there you go you figured it out so there was the world of the medieval book and there and there is the digital image of it uh, as a surrogate that is defined entirely by its relationship to its original and and sort of seen not to contain uh, as much information as the original but but it's a decent it's a decent surrogate and and all the, nearly all the metadata associated with the digital object is is related ultimately back to the to the original. Um, uh, I want to complicate this picture. I think that uh, we need to take digital images seriously in their own right as uh, primary sources, which is after all how scholars nearly always, in fact, use them. Uh, clearly, there, there is a complicated relationship between a digital image and the thing that uh, it copies. Um, and that's an interesting, an interesting intersection. Uh, but the advantages of t treating these images as uh, as data in their own right um, are just are just we think sort of enormous. Uh, so we want to make complete open data uh, available to as many people as possible in a way uh, that they can most easily reuse it. Uh, uh, reuse of data being. I think actually probably the foundation of the digital humanities. And one of the things that I would say is that images, they don't exist in, 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 in the original manuscript. They're man-made creations, and they were created around 2008. Um, further, if I take the same two images instead of adding one on top of the other, and rather I, I subtract it, then I can create a fundamentally different type of image. I can create that image, which gets rid of the overtext. And, I show you an image actually from the end of Floating Bodies Book Two, which shows the unique source for the diagrams that Archimedes drew in the sand in Syracuse in the third century BC, and you simply can't see anywhere else, certainly not in the original manuscript. So um, that bodes the question, how do we know that I'm not just totally making this up? Uh, how, do, how do people know that there's original data that we're actually using? And you know, when Doug and I were working on this, we were working in a museum. We didn't know about research libraries. And, we went to NASA to work out what they, how they, how they would suggest we uh, we presented presented our data set, and we spoke to a guy called Don Sawyer, who was responsible for the lead development of the archive reference model, uh, which you can see in his experience under 1996. And from that, um, we created the Archimedes Palimpsest uh, data set, and 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 we think that while a book looks like it does on the left in the 13th century, data looks like it does on the right in the, in, in, in the 21st. And of course, to a humanist, it looks incredibly boring and somewhat intimidating. To a, to a, to a, uh, to a geek, it's perfectly straightforward. And, and underneath it are just boring files after boring files. But what they do is they, they're full resolution files. Um, and, uh, and they're documented uh, fully documented as, as as digital assets rather than as books. You won't find any codicological information in this website about the original. Nearly all the information is simply about the digital the digital object, and that makes it stand in vast contrast to the way that we display cultural heritage assets generally. And when I say we, I just mean the re the, the research library community in general, uh, where you're getting a web derivative, you're getting very little information about that derivative. Uh, it's very difficult for uh, machines and humanists to, to 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 download and reuse this data. I mean, all they can do is all they can all they can easily do is is look at it and maybe download an image at a time. So we made our data uh, openly available for anyone to use for free for any for any reason that they that they want, and we concentrated on on making it not just complete but but reusable and. You know, as I was saying, I didn't think that, that, that the Archimedes data presented like this was a, would be of any use to any humanist at all. So I paid for, a vet, for, the, uh, for MIF, the Maryland Institute of Technologies and Humanities, to build a multispectral imaging uh, interface for people to use, which I thought was pretty cool. 
uh, and you can do this. And looking on the left there, you can look at all the different wave bands of light in various degrees of transparency. And I thought that this would be sort of sort of helpful for people. Uh, and then sort of two weeks after I paid the $10,000 to do this, a guy called Greg Etchelberger from MIT um, sort of trumped me. Um, he said that he'd taken all our data, thank you very much for it being openly available, and he put it into a Google Maps interface. And by the way, he'd also put the transcriptions line by line with the images, and he'd done it. He'd, he'd, he'd just sort of done it for free. And that was when my life changed. That's when I realized that actually we should be creating data for other people uh, to reuse. We can make sustainable data this way, um, and it can be repurposed for any number of interfaces. Uh, Doug and I next work, worked on this palimpsest, where uh, uh, it's a much more difficult palimpsest than the, than the Archimedes palimpsest. It's far harder to read. Um, it contains um, Sergius of Reshana's uh, translation of Galen's on simple drugs, uh, and it's an incredibly important manuscript in the history of the transmission of medical text. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's unique, apart from a couple of fragments in the British Library. Uh, so we did exactly the same thing, and we, we didn't even really invest in a website. We just put it up under the Archimedes palimpsest umbrella um, as a web page and, and, and told the seriousists that, that they could have at it. But, but you, get, you get the picture. Um, what we were presenting was a fridge for anyone to use, and we did this data set in about 2008. And luckily, the Syriacs understood, the Syriacists under, understood what we were doing. They applied to the uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council in Great Britain for a million dollar grant to investigate this data, this raw data, um, uh, as, as a cultural asset in its own right without any reference to the manuscript. And they got a million dollars, I mean a million pounds, and they are now busy further processing the manuscript and further using it. Uh, without actually consulting us at all, which I think is which I think is a um, a wonderful testimony to the creation of really good sort of sort of data. Um, it's extremely well documented data. I mean, it's data that you know exactly what it is. You know exactly its relationship to the capture. You know exactly how to use it. It's very straightforward. There are no bells and whistles, and it's very unlike the way that we present data at the moment. We wanted to make data sets that uh, made data promiscuous. That is to say, we wanted to make data sets that were available uh, to all sorts of people in a very, very simple way. And that wasn't true of either the Archimedes data or the Galen data, where we were dealing with you know, geeks that we could, we could really nurture. Uh, our next project was um, digitizing the illuminated manuscripts of the Walters Art Museum, which had a far wider audience, and it also had uh, uh, it had medieval art historians uh, who aren't geeks. Um, and we realized that while we were quite good at creating data that machines could get down and geeks could get down, what we did want to do was to present an incredibly simple interface for, for humans to read as well. So on top of our data set, we combined the images with, um, with our TEI data to create uh, the simplest um, style sheet that would present all our information in human readable form as a fully illustrated catalog on top of the data sets. And so here you go uh, with, with images uh, for humans to get at uh, without any technological skill. They can download a flyleaf of Walters W7 at 600 dpi if you want, because that was the resolution at which we were stupid enough to take the picture. And our philosophy is if we're stupid enough to take it at that high resolution, then we, then we should make it available at that resolution and for free for anybody to do what they want with. Um, and we also supplied uh, the TEI information in this, in this, style, sheet, in this style sheet for them. Uh, it's an extremely uh, well-used data set. If you Google, I don't know, illuminated gospel book on, on Google images, you'll find that the Walters data is up there, if not front and center, very, very close. Um, but it was also uh, very easy for other places to ingest. Now, the Walters Art Museum is a museum. It's good at conserving pots, not data. Um, but Stanford were, if you remembered the Parker in the Web project that they spent about $8 million on, suddenly they could get the same number of illuminated manuscripts for free, and they just ingested all our data. Uh, 
so we think that we create data that's very very easy to easy to move around both for humans and machines and there it is on uh, the Stanford site. I mean, now it's sort of buried in the Stanford site. It's not. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not accessible as as we would like. So we're going to also ingest the data into uh, the thing that I'm about to talk about, which is uh, which is open. You know, one of the things about cultural heritage centers in general is that there are digital haves and digital have-nots. And if we're ever going to cover the ground. Uh, and digitize what needs to get digitized for people to new, use in new and exciting ways, we're going to have to collaborate. We're going to have to collaborate with people uh, who, who, who don't, have the, don't have the wherewithal to, to digitize their own stuff in a, in, in, in a useful manner. Um, and this is part of the, uh, this, is, this is open, is, is in a sense modeled on NASA's data portal. Uh, which has data sets from all over the scientific community, from JPL, from the Meteorological Society, and it hosts their data. So we want to create open, and Penn Libraries is, is hosting uh, open, and this is open that Doug is going to talk about in more detail. Uh, it contains complete high-resolution archival images of cultural heritage materials from collections of contributing institutions, along with machine-readable, descriptive, and technical metadata. All materials on open are in the public domain or released under Creative Commons licenses as free cultural works. Um, I'm just looking at the first of those uh, collections right now, the Abraham Lincoln Foundation of the Union League in Philadelphia, uh, which doesn't have a technical infrastructure but does have historic documents. Uh, one of them uh, at the bottom of this slide is the uh, assassination testimony reported by James Tanner, uh, which exists in one in one manuscript, um, and uh, and uh, we hosted it on open in this very simple way, um, and and here it is, um, you know, in the infrastructure of Penn Libraries, but. Anyone can anyone can use this data. It's as easy for the Lincoln Foundation as us to use it and reuse it and re-employ it. So um, here's Slate Magazine, who got news of the story and and just put a book reader live streaming from Open, and the Heritage Center at the at the Abraham Lincoln Foundation at the Union League can do exactly the same exactly the same thing. So it's a win-win for them and it's a win-win for us. And uh, we're taking this model now. Uh, we've just been awarded a clear grant to, or I should say, the University of Lehigh, Penn Libraries, and the Free Library of Philadelphia have been awarded a clear grant to put on open and make available to everybody um, uh, medieval manuscripts in 16 institutions in Philadelphia. I just show, I just show eight of them there, um, and. Uh, and essentially, what we're going to be doing is 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 going to be creating this this fridge of data that anyone, including those sixteen institutions, uh, can use just as easily as we can use it ourselves. Um, and we think that this is a m much more exciting model than the default silos in the sky that institutions at the moment are basically creating. So we want to make complete data, we want to make reusable data, we want to make promiscuous data, and we want to make community data. Um, of course, what we want to do is to make open data. And you know, the trouble is that, that you know, it's an, incredibly, it's an incredibly overused term, open data. Um, and some people use it, uh, you know, they should be sued under the Trade Descriptions Act. I'm not a geek, I'm not a lawyer. I think it's open data uh, if, uh, if you have as much access to it and control over it as the people that made it. And that was our aim in Open. And Open is not my achievement. Open is the achievement of Doug Emery. And uh, I'm now going to hand over to him to take it away on his presentation. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Will. So I want to restate a little bit of what uh, Will said uh, about open in this uh, opening slide and talk about uh, the philosophy of open. And, and basically, it's a philosophy of no friction uh, for users uh, who are trying to come and get the data or who want to know what they can do with the data. And so the question is, you know, how do you achieve that? And from my point of view, uh, you, you can't have any mediation. 
That is, you need to have direct access to the data. Uh, you, you can't have any technical hurdles. You can't need special tools or need to have any kind of programming knowledge in order to be able to get to the data that you want, as, as much or as little of it. And there's no legal hurdle. You don't have to ask permission. You know that you can use the data and you know under what terms. So no mediation. And the way that we do this, as Will said, is to provide the best, of, best available uh, digital images and metadata. Uh, interfaces are great. But we want to make sure that people can get to the data, too, and they have direct access to the data. And so we do this by making it available via uh, common known protocols, HTTP, anonymous FTP, and the RSync protocol. And there's no technical hurdle. Again, there's no programming knowledge required, no special tools. You can come to the site via a web browser or a, a common free downloadable FTP client. Or you can use commonly available command line tools like wget or rsync, and I'll mention those a little bit later on. No legal hurdle. So we, all, we use a series of uh, Creative Commons marks, dedications, uh, and licenses that are all approved uh, for free cultural works. I don't want to get much into the free culture movement here, uh, but there's a nice Creative Commons page on this, and if you Google for Creative Commons free culture or Creative Commons free works, you'll find this page which will explain it and the licenses that we use. So what is open? Well, at present, it's 18 terabytes of data, uh, 1,677 documents as of last night, uh, 274,000 uh, master files are on the site, each of which has two derivatives, a, JPEG, a web JPEG and a thumbnail image. Uh, and we're growing all the time. Some weeks we add as many as 100 documents. We're looking soon to be uh, adding uh, 2,000 other manuscripts that are not yet on the site uh, uh, from Penn's Indian collection to give you an idea of how uh, quickly and uh, how much we're growing all the time. So when you come to the site, though, it's really kind of boring. And, and, it, and it's boring intentionally. So, uh, so people who first started using uh, the Internet in the 1990s, uh, as I did, will recognize this kind of display where essentially web, most web, a lot of web servers were just file servers that allowed you to browse the contents of a, of a computer on the Internet. And that's what we allow you to do here. Uh, the open is essentially a file server that's sitting on the web. At the, at the home page of the site, which is at open.library.upen.edu, You'll see uh, this directory listing. There are four files there and one directory, the data directory, which contains all of the data on the site, a robots.txt file, which is for uh, search engines like Google to use when they're crawling the site, and then three HTML files. Uh, each one of these HTML files is actually uh, accessible from the top of the page anywhere on the site, uh, the introduction, uh, link takes you to the readme.html file, the technical help link li links you to the technical readme.html file, and the collections link links you to the collections.html page, which is a list of all the collections that are on open. I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn uh, real briefly. Uh, this is it's kind of boring to talk about uh, documentation, but really if you want to get the most out of open, the docu documentation is where you should go. First, looking at the readme.html uh, file. So the readme file is very high level. It gives information about the licenses that we use, for instance, and the intended audiences of the site, uh, useful information like recommended citation styles. Also, a very high level and simple description of the images and document descriptions that you'll find on open, as well as, again, very uh, simple instructions on how to use the data set. Uh, if you look at these instructions on how to use the data set, what they'll say is if you're coming here using a web browser, then probably what you want to do is click on the collections page and start looking at the collections that are on open. And if you're interested in other me methods, you should go to the technical readme. And if you really want to know how to use open, the place to go is to the technical readme. Uh, this is the meat of information about what is on open, how the data is structured, uh, and how the data is structured is very important. One of the things that um, Will likes to say, uh, and then he would add to my bullet points early on about the open philosophy, a critical part of this is documentation. 
And one of the things that makes our data easy to use is that it's extremely regular and that we document it very in, in great detail. And in fact, if you're looking at our technical readme and you find that there are things that are missing or that are incorrect, we want to know about that because this documentation that we provide is the key uh, to understanding how to use the site and making sure that the most people can get the most use out of it. So on the technical readme, uh, there's a great deal of information. The, the things that I want to point out that are um, that I think are most useful to people who are just coming to, to the site and who are interested in downloading lots of data are first the, the diagrams on navigation and on package structure. So each document that's hosted on open is in a, is in a, is in a directory that we call a package that is constructed in a, in a highly regular way. Uh, information on the technical and uh, preservation metadata that we provide. We use the TEI, that is the Text Encoding Initiative Guidelines, in order to construct our manuscript descriptions and the structural metadata that associates the images with those manuscript descriptions. We use XMP, which is a common standard for the sharing of technical metadata about media files, and we use that for our images. We, all, we have extremely detailed documentation of how we employ the TEI to describe manuscripts so that if you want to, to take and use our descriptions in your applications, this would be the place to start. We talk about the standards that, employ, that we employ, and then very importantly at the end, for people who are interested in doing bulk downloads and probably and may not have experience doing that, we provide very detailed instructions on how you can get tools like rsync and wget on your system, and then recipes for how to use those tools to, do, to download uh, all of a manuscript or all of a number of manuscripts and or to download specific files, perhaps all of the JPEGs for all of the manuscripts that are on open if you want to do such a thing. Uh, the collections page, Will has already shown. Uh, I'm not going to go in too much detail on that here since he's shown you how that works, but I want to point out a couple of details that are important for people who are coming and want to know how is it that I navigate the site, how do I find that what I'm looking for if I'm actually looking for uh, if I'm if I'm actually looking for the the location of the files within the file system. So on the collections page you'll see each collection that's on open. The collection ID, this is a very important piece of information and I'll talk about this again in a minute. The metadata type, right now the only one that we support is TEI, but for a single collection, and this corresponds to a single folder of documents that are on open, all those documents will have the same metadata type. In the future, uh, we're hoping to host archival materials and we will be adding EAD at that time as a metadata type, but for now, it's all TEI. And then a brief description of the collection itself. I'm going to jump out of here and I'm going to open up my, uh, my web browser and take you to the open home page. So this is the open home page, and I'm going to jump real quickly into the, the collections page and show you some of the details that I think are important. As I said, uh, looking on for each collection, we have the collection ID and the metadata format. Uh, you can see that this is for the, the collection that Will was showing earlier, the Abraham Lincoln Foundation of the Union League of Philadelphia. The collection ID is 11. Bryn Mawr College, the collection ID is 3. Drexel University Archives, the collection ID is 4, and so on. Um, this information is repeated on the, on the documents, the documents web page. Now, I'm going to go into the data directory from the home page of open. So now rather than looking at the human readable version, I'm going into the drilling into the directory path itself. And you'll see that inside this directory are a number of number directories. And they number one down to, I believe, 14 or 15 now. But the one that we're interested in is, is number 11, which is the one that corresponds to the Abraham Lincoln Foundation where we are now. And if I click on that, you'll see that there are, are a number, there are five somewhat cryptically named folders uh, in this directory. I'm going to jump back to the collection page now and go down to the bottom where it lists the documents that are on open. You'll, you'll notice that each one of these documents uh, in the 11 uh, collection folder, um, each one of these documents from the, uh, from the Abraham Lincoln Foundation has a call number. So the very last one of these is XI2 Lincolniana. 
we click on the, if I go back to the, the tab where we can see the, the directory listing, we see that the very last directory is xi underscore to underscore Lincolniana. So <clears throat> the collection identifier is really useful because it tells you where to look for, where to look on the file system for the file that you're looking for. The, I'm trying to think about what the best place to go to next is. If I click on the browse page, again, you can see all of the information that Will was showing earlier about uh, metadata <clears throat> describing the manuscript, as well as a table of contents uh, for the sections of the manuscript that are linked down to the images, and then a list of the images themselves. If I click on the TEI XML file, then I will get a direct link to the TEI file that lives in the data directory for that manuscript. And this is all of the same information that you see on the that you see on the HTML human readable description, but in a, a machine readable format. And you'll also see in this directory, I mean in the TEI file, <clears throat> the facsimile section, which is where we uh, list the structural metadata about the manuscript. And this is linked to the files that exist in the in the manuscript package directory. So the front cover, the inside front cover, uh, the all of the pages, and these are all listed in number. You'll notice too that all of the file uh, names uh, have serial numbers. The first one is zero, the next one is one, the, the following one is two, that follow the natural order of the that follow the natural order of the images as they relate to the book. Finally, you can click on the data directory, which links you directly to the data directory that contains the information for that, for that document. If I were to go into the, uh, sec the, the Abraham Lincoln Foundation collection directory and then click on the, uh, the call number for this document, I would put myself in exactly the same place. Um, if you want to, if you're on the, the table of contents page and you wanted to get the link that you need to, to use to download an entire manuscript, then this is the place that you would go. I think that that's enough for now about showing you the structure of the way that, the way the files are created. I want to take just a quick minute and point out some highlights on the technical help page. And then I think I'll be, I'll, I'll finish up and then we can open it up to questions. So here now I am on the technical readme page, which I uh, access by going to the top of the page and clicking on technical help. There's information on the licenses that we use. Uh, there are text diagrams that show you how the entire site is structured and the files that exist on the site. Information about connecting via HTTP uh, using anonymous FTP using the rsync protocol to connect, detailed descriptions of the file naming conventions, how the files are named, uh, and how the files are named, what the different little codes that occur in the file names mean, how to navigate the site and get to the site that you want, either using the HTML page or by using the TEI. Detailed navigation instructions for working with each one of the packages. So this is a, a package for LJS 319. It contains a data directory. It shows you the directory that you'll find under that package. It gives you a diagram of how the, the data is structured. Information on the preservation and technical metadata that we provide. So each one of the packages is provided with a Manifest, you can use this manifest to make sure that you have all the files that are expected to be in, that are expected to be in a given document package, and then allows you also to validate it to make sure that the files haven't changed or have become corrupt. Information about how to use, to do file, do package validation. I'm going to jump down to the, uh, our description of how we use the TEI, uh, to do our document description. There are links to the TEI P5 guidelines, which is the, the version of the, P, of the TEI that we use. And again, a detailed description of exactly what elements we're using from the TEI and what values you'll find in there and how it's structured. So if you want to build applications that take advantage of our TEI documents, this is, again, this is a good place to go. And then finally, skipping down to the bottom, 
are the sections on using on using uh, rsync and wget. First, there's an appendix on using wget. As I was saying, wget is a good program to use if you want to download all or part of the open website or of a collection or of a, an individual manuscript or a number of manuscripts. It is a command line tool, but we provide very detailed instructions on how to install it. And then Dot Porter, who wrote these uh, instructions, provides nice recipes for how to load, download a single file, how to lo download multiple files, how to download multiple files of a particular type. This is an example of how to load, download all of the JPEG files of a particular type. And then there are instructions on using the rsync protocol, which is a, uh, which is a, uh, a tool for doing remote synchronization across file systems, and it's very often used across the internet to create mirrors of websites. And in fact, if you wanted to, uh, you could create a mirror of the open site. You'd need a lot of storage space to do it. Uh, and there are, there's a recipe down here at the bottom for how to uh, mirror all of open. So one of the, uh, the other, meta we'll use the metaphor of uh, the fridge as a, as a place to put data. Uh, and, and, I, and I like that metaphor very much. Another one that, that, that I like to use is the idea that what we're doing is we're opening the stacks of the library. We're giving you direct access to the stacks of the digital library to allow you to come in and get exactly what it is that you want and browse the collection itself and not, um, if, if, what you, if you're not interested or you, for some reason um, you, you feel limited by uh, a user interface. And we're not against user interfaces. We build interfaces ourselves, but we feel that it's really important that you be able to access uh, the data directly. I don't think I've got anything more now. Um, so if there are any questions, Will and I are happy to take them. I think that I think that there's just one thing that one thing that I think uh, in the past, you know, it's been seen as um, as open is sort of a minimal minimal solution uh, for people that, that that can't afford to give flashier presentations. And and I think that we're both keen on the fact that that we. That that's not how we see this. Um, there are certainly things that that Open doesn't do, uh, but we think that all institutions should provide open access to the stacks of their files uh, in a way that's somewhat similar to this. Yes, Glad absolutely. You with me. I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I do see we have a, a couple of questions um, here. So from my colleague Roy Tennant asks, uh, have you considered offering an option where all the files from a given work are tarred up and gzipped? Uh, we have. Uh, we don't do that now because we don't have a, a dynamic way to do that. Uh, and we also want people to be able to pick and choose. And so it would be very, and, and so if you geez up all of the files, some of these would run to a couple of hundred gigabytes. So it would, you, it would be a lot uh, to download. It would be very slow. And one of the things that I should explain about Open is that it's completely non-dynamic. There isn't any, uh, all the pages, it's just static content, static images, static web pages, and so it's just generated and then pushed out to the side and works statically. So we don't really have the capability of providing gzipped or tarred packages, though that would be nice to do in the future at some point. Thank you. Uh, there's a second question from Roy, um, and I'm just going to pause here for a second. So I wasn't seeing Roy's questions because he was sending them to um, all attendees and not all participants. Um, I think I'm finding out that all attendees means you all in the audience, the peanut gallery. Um, so if you've, uh, if you've submitted a question and you've sent it to all attendees, then um, Doug and Will and I aren't seeing those, so, uh, so check that out. Um, Roy had a second question, which was, uh, do you have any statistics on uh, downloading? The, the answer is that we're in the process of, of finding that, uh, trying to uh, 
get them, getting that information now. We have extensive logs, and we are working on we're working on developing a log, working with a vendor to do log analysis. I know that on the Walter site, which we will refer to earlier, we were in a situation where the the entire site was being downloaded about 10 times a year. So we'd get about 100 terabytes of downloads on that site uh, over a single year. I'm expecting that Open will be somewhat similar, that we'll be doing uh, several terabytes of downloads a month, but we don't have that information yet. Okay, thanks. And especially, I think as you uh, as you expand the the types of content that you're uh, making available, you know, you'd want to be able to see. You'll probably have an increased audience for uh, for this type of material. So, um, good to good to be able to collect information about that. Um, here's a, a question on metadata. I knew we'd get into to metadata. Um, how did you decide to use TEI instead of METS? And how are the TEI documents? Uh, created. So the we chose the TEI in, in part because we had used the TEI in the Walters, and the reason that we chose it both here and in the Walters is what we started doing was manuscript description, and the TEI is very well suited to doing manuscript description. Uh, so that was the the basis of that choice. Um, what was the second question again? Um, oh, how are the TEI documents created? How are they generated? So in the case of, they're generated in two ways. For documents that are in PEN's catalog, we actually pull that data dynamically from the MARC records using MARC XML and then uh, pull it out and put it into the TEI format. For documents that aren't in PEN's catalog, we have spreadsheets that our partners fill in that contain both uh, document level descriptive metadata and then structural metadata, and that data and that information is read out of those spreadsheets and put into the TEI. Okay. Have you, um, I'll just add a follow-up question to that. Have you considered using METS at all and then linking out to either TEI descriptions or descriptions in MARC XML? Not, not in any depth, no. It's something that, it's an idea that's been bouncing around, but we haven't, it hasn't been pursued. Okay, questions are flooding in here. Um, are you sharing copyrighted content and other types of restricted content through open? And if so, how do you communicate rights, if at all? So very often the, the metadata will be copyrighted. And so what we do, and I'm going to open up um, I was going to share my uh, share my web browser for a second. Yep. So all of the, any data that is, is copyrighted is either given a CC0 license, that is, uh, it's the public domain dedication for copyrighted works, or we use a CC BY, that is, we, a, a Creative Commons attribution license, or a CC BY SA, a Creative Commons attribution share alike license. You can find this information. Uh, it is made available in the TEI files. Let me let me, let me navigate real quickly to a. So you'll see here on the collection page for the Abraham Lincoln Foundation, there's information about the licenses that they use that's on that page. If I go down to an individual file, an indi individual document, there's license information here. The license information that is on this page is actually extracted from the TEI file, which is under the, the TEI um, publication statement. It is also embedded in the header of every image that's on the website. So it's embedded in the header of the, in the headers of the, the TIFFs, the web JPEGs that we provide, and the thumbnails. 
So if, if what I um, understand uh, is that this, the, the metadata may be copyrighted, but it's also um, available under a CC license. That is correct. Okay. And we don't um, host anything that's we don't host anything that's more restrictively licensed. Okay. So you haven't drifted into the 20th century, for example, in terms of materials that you're making available. Not, not, unless, not unless it's openly licensed. And one of our, some of our, we're we're imaging diaries from from uh, various Philadelphia institutions. Some of them might be 20th century, but if they are, you know, the criteria, the bar is: are you CC SABY or, I mean, are you a free cultural work or not? And if you're not, then you then you can't get in. Right. And okay. And arguably, that the, all the metadata is 20th century and 21st century product. It's being created by institutions who, I assume, have the right to copyright this material. So we ask them to release that as well. I mean, the content, uh, as Will was saying, uh, most of the content is well before the 20th century, but we are looking at contents in the 20th century, and we're trying to, in the cases where we want to share that, we're trying to con uh, secure permission to share it. And as free cultural works. Okay, uh, getting into some more technical details. Given the openness to replication of files, do you have any canonical ID, IDs for files that would appear across instances? So, do you have? Um, are you are you getting into territory where you have shelf marks that are? That are similar, and do you worry about your? How much do you worry about your um, your IDs for files? So, I'm going to again. I'm going to jump back to the uh, to sharing my browser. So, perhaps the best place to go is to the technical help. And down to the the file name uh, description. So it is possible that that two documents might have the same call number, and but we require that for a given collection. So if you went into the eleven collection folder, you would find no two shelf marks that were identical. Now it might be that there's another that shelf mark exists in another collection, and we don't have a way of uh, controlling that. So we we scope. Uh, the shelf marks, or the, at least the, the names of the folders, to to particular documents. The, however, each one of the image file names is composed of two pieces. The, the last portion is a serial number that tells you what order the image comes in, but the first portion is is a document ID that's an arbitrary ID that is collected from uh, that, that's created in the database, and no two documents have the same ID, regardless of what their call number is, and so no two files uh, that represent different things will have the same name, which is not this, quite the same as having a canonical ID, but it is a way of preventing uh, name collision. Okay, thank you. What is your timetable on providing access to archival materials through Open? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> We, so we don't have a definite timetable. It's in the vague sort of fuzzy future. At present, we have a lot of uh, manuscript material that we're handling that for which we're using the TEI. But there are projects that are coming down the line where we are going to be looking at, at archival material. And we have internal materials here at the University of Pennsylvania that we want to share that are archival material. So it's something that's going to happen, but we can't make any definite make any definite statements now about when that will happen. So stay few, tuned. I would say. Yeah, stay yeah. tuned. But a few okay. years. Uh, I would uh, say I'm more ambitious than that. Two years. Okay. We'll 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 return back to you at that point and, and see how we're doing. Um, here's another question. Who is responsible for the long-term pre uh, preservation of the data? So our, 
our base position is it's the institution's responsibility for the, for the long-term preservation of the data. That is to say, each institution that's sharing information on open should know that open is a way of presenting the data, and it isn't itself an archive. Uh, so it, PEN is responsible for its, the preservation of its data, and in some cases, we agree to be responsible for the preservation of other institutions' data, but for the most part, it's the responsibility of each institution to maintain their own uh, archive. I should add that for um, our recent clear grant award, um, obviously we had to demonstrate um, preservation, our preservation component, which is not open. And Penn Libraries is going to archive a copy of that data, and uh, Lehigh is also independently going to archive a copy of that data. Okay, thank you. Uh, so since this is an access repository, does Open harvest the augmentations, new metadata, new transcriptions, et cetera, to your files which are generated elsewhere? I think if I'm understanding this correctly, um, your files go off and have amazing new lives and new information is generated uh, about those collections. Do you then, uh, are you able to take some of that um, uh, new goodness and uh, make your own uh, descriptions better? Is that part of your practice? Not at present. Yeah, no, I would, I would, uh, I would, um, I would, I would disagree with that. Uh, <laughs> we, the data does have new lives and it does get out there in various different formats. And uh, sometimes sort of core data is is revealed that we would like to include in our, re-include in our metadata. Um, but at the moment, we're in the business of producing, I would say, the first generation, and we're, and, and, and we're delighted that other people are getting research results out of our data, but we're not, we're not systematically trying to update our curatorial or digital files. Okay, thank you. Uh, for linked data purposes, do the digital files have an ID that exists above all the instance file names? Not at present. Is that something you might uh, consider? Pardon? Is, uh, is that something that you're considering is linked data uh, and having identifiers factoring into your thinking about the structure of open? It's something that, that we want to explore. Uh, I see that the next question is about uh, IIIF conformance, <clears throat> and that's a, a linked data technology. Our and we have actually uh, generated, uh, as an experiment, uh, Dot Porter generated a manifest for a number of our documents and placed that in a IIIF F instance that was sitting on top of, of open, which is not the same as you know, building uh, digital file IDs, but this is something that we're interested in. Though my inclination is that this isn't what open is intended for. I think it would be nice to expose on the site some linked data information so that people could get semantic information about the objects. But my feeling is that, for instance, for PEN's materials, the PEN libraries has an investment in deciding how it's going to share linked data information about its assets and through what methods it's going to share that information. And so that feels to me like the, the more logical place to do that kind of work. And to be clear, Penn Libraries has bought into uh, IIIF and, uh, and, we're, and we're busily working on installing IIIF. And the question of whether, of whether we do that via open or by, or by other access, other ways of accessing our website, is, or both, is, is, is at the moment, uh, you know, being explored and open. I mean, IIIF is, is clearly a great thing. I don't see any other questions at the moment, um, but I'm wondering if to close, each of you might 
share a, uh, a favorite story about um, reuse of materials in Open or one of your other Open Data repositories? Uh, yeah, I can do one for um, for, an, for 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 an image in, in in the Walters Art Museum. My favorite story is I had it was a rather a 13th century um, a, a 13th century illumination of a rather obscure guy called Cesarius, and uh, and uh, it it was put up not just on the digital Walters but but all over the place, and it was picked up by Don Mario, who was the who was the um, who was the uh, priest of the Church of Terracina in Italy, and he he wanted to know if it was Saint Cesarius of his church. And I wrote back and I said I have no idea. And he said I think it is. Um, and he said, uh, uh, will you check his 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 feast days on November the first? So I went to the calendar for the same manuscript, and indeed, uh, it it was his saint. St. Cesarius, which is completely bizarre, really obscure, and is the first image of St. Cesarius in Western art. So if that's, a, that's a sort of a nice story and, and, um, and, and sort of typical, I think, of, of what can happen if you can make your data genuinely promiscuous. Yeah, he found his way home. Yeah. So, okay. Hey, right, Doug's uh, got his story. Yeah, Doug. <laughs> So this isn't this isn't quite as romantic as as Will's story, but what I like is the work that that Dot Porter, who I've known for a number of years, when we were working on the Walters project and used the Walters data, and who's now using the the open data to create uh, using the open data to create websites, and what she has done is she has uploaded. The open data to ViewShare, which is a service that's provided by the Library of Congress, and the link is the links are in the presentation, where you can go and browse through the data, both from Open and the Digital Walters. And she's created also using the the data she's created book readers, so using the Internet Archive book reader form uh, technology, so that you can and the, this data is actually it's backed by Open. So she has on her site. She has little page turners that point to open, and so you can flip through the books. She's generated eBooks using the data that's on open, and then she shares the code. So if you go to Dot's uh, GitHub account at Leoba, you'll find code that she's used to create the ViewShare data that she uploaded to ViewShare, and the and the and the uh, scripts that she's used to generate the eBooks from the Walters uh, from the Walters and the uh, open manuscript data. So, uh, you know, these are the kind of, this is the sort of thing that really appeals to me as someone who's taken the data, who's created uh, scripts for doing that, who's shared those scripts with other people and is finding new ways to take advantage of the, the data that's there uh, so that other people can access it. Uh, and I should say that one of the nice things about, um, so we're, we're digitizing uh, historic diaries in the Philadelphia region. And we're just sticking up on open, but the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries uh, is making is making is making is making the, the data available on 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 their on their website as as a presentable set of diaries in in page terms, which is kind of neat. Well, we're about out of time, but I want to thank you two so much for uh, sharing your project with us. And uh, as I said, we'll be uh, posting the slides sharing these links that Doug has put together so that you can check them out and explore them, and also making this recording available so that you can uh, listen to it again and uh, share with your colleagues, of course. Um, okay. So we'll send you an email when that's all, all ready, and I want to uh, say goodbye and thanks for attending today's webinar. Thank you. Can we, can we just say that we'd love, we'd love further feedback and you can get hold of, hold of us um, at the University of Pennsylvania, my email address is wgnoel at upenn.edu. We'll be sure to share that in the in the information that we distribute. So and encourage people to send their continue to send their feedback and uh, and ideas. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Marilee. Thank you.